Digital Foundry is proudly sponsored by Omen's new wireless range of mice, keyboards and headsets. After impressing us last month with Vicarious Visions developed Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2, Activision has another revival up its sleeve with Crash Bandicoot 4. It's about time. This is all part of what I assume to be the master plan. Remake classic games first, then build something new from what you've learned. If Crash 4 is any indication, the strategy might just pay off. I've been playing the game over the past few days then, and am suitably impressed with what they've achieved. It feels like a faithful return to the world of Crash Bandicoot with numerous improvements that never detract from the original formula. Crash 4 also makes use of Unreal Engine 4, offering numerous technical improvements over the recent remakes, including a higher frame rate, at least on the right hardware. So today on this episode of Digital Foundry, we're checking out the game's visuals, comparing them across platforms while discussing the performance situation across all current generation machines. Ready? Let's get into it. After lying dormant for many years, Crash Bandicoot made his triumphant return with Crash Bandicoot The Insane Trilogy back in 2017. Initially released on PS4, with ports to Switch and Xbox and the PC coming a year later, the Insane Trilogy was a solid package. Powered by Vicarious Vision's own alchemy engine, Vicarious being the original developer for the updated trilogy, it looks fantastic, but it runs at just 30 frames per second on all consoles. With Crash 4, however, developer Toys for Bob has made the jump to Unreal Engine, and with it comes a noticeable boost in both visual quality and frame rate. This is a great looking game and easily the best looking Crash Bandicoot title ever made. The game begins with a nice looking full motion video sequence but quickly makes the jump to real time graphics which make a strong first impression. Crash 4 perfectly captures the look and feel of an animated film. Expressive character models stretch and squish in both cinematics and gameplay while gorgeous per pixel motion blur accentuates every movement. The Unreal Engine 4 motion blur is one of my favorite things here though. The shutter speed settings and the quality of the blur itself is just perfect. Of course, you can disable motion blur from the options menu if you're a heathen. The quality of the animation work though truly is on point here and elevates the game to a new level. The run cycle, the jumping, just everything, it's perfect. The simple act of moving and jumping around feels better than any previous game due both to the animation quality and performance. Background detail is ramped up as well, with beautifully off-kilter models lending the game that exaggerated look that you'd expect from Crash, while still offering a dramatic boost in detail. It's still very much an on-rails experience, but that's perfectly fine for Crash, that's how it should be, and it allows the developers to build some stunning looking worlds to explore. I especially appreciate the materials quality and lighting, it's a cartoony game for sure, but everything has this tangible feel, almost like what you'd expect from a pre-rendered CGI film. It's just a great example of a game that combines a wide range of modern visual effects to create something very cohesive and beautiful to the eye. Other nice details include screen space reflections. Now there's nothing new about this technique of course, but the rail guided nature of the camera system means that you rarely see its limitations, so it looks excellent. Liquid surfaces also react to movement with ripples forming in your wake. Again, a small detail, but it helps create this very consistent and interactive feeling world. Perhaps most importantly though, everything you see here is intact no matter where you play the game, which is where we get into our first point of comparison between the different console versions. As always, I tested the game on the various PlayStation 4 and Xbox One variants. So what are we looking at then? Well, resolution-wise, image quality is interesting. It seems to target 1080p on all consoles except the base Xbox One, which appears to be 900p instead. Now, the Xbox One X version does at least receive a crisp 4K user interface, mind you, but the 3D rendering always appears to be a lower resolution. Each system also seems to take advantage of dynamic resolution scaling, occasionally dipping 
a little bit under 1080p. Thankfully, despite the somewhat lower pixel count, it's really not a huge issue. Unreal's image treatment puts in the work here and the game winds up looking super clean across all platforms. Yes, it's a little soft, but it has a rather CG-like appearance that is rather attractive. Now, when putting the different versions side by side, however, we do start to notice some interesting things. Firstly, with the PS4 version, I noticed that it's effectively identical between the PlayStation 4 Professional and the PlayStation 4 Amateur. It's similar with Xbox One and Xbox One X, except shadow and rendering resolution are both lower on Microsoft's earlier machine. Now, it's fun to see them side by side, obviously, but there's really not much to it, right? Well, when comparing PlayStation 4 against Xbox One, I started to notice some minor differences. Namely, the shadows and ambient shadows differ between the two consoles. These shadows are now less refined on Xbox One in general, and the contact shadows seem to be entirely absent as well. Furthermore, if you look closely, you might spot some texture differences as well. Look at the eye in this shot. I noticed several details like this when comparing Xbox One X to the PS4 Pro. Now, to be fair, this isn't something you'd likely notice during normal play, but it is fascinating. To me, this almost suggests that the visual makeup is defined first and foremost by each base machine. So while the rendering resolution and shadow resolution is increased slightly on Xbox One X, the visual settings seem to be consistent with the less powerful Xbox One. Either way, it looks gorgeous, but PS4 owners receive a slightly more refined experience. It's just a shame that there's no high resolution rendering option in preparation for the new consoles, though perhaps PS5 and Xbox Series X patches already are in the works. We'll just have to wait and see. So differences are minor in terms of visual makeup, and it seems the team did a great job with its multi-platform target. You have a great looking game across all machines. As we move into our next section, however, the comparison starts to heat up. I'm of course talking about performance. So, the Insane Trilogy was capped at 30 frames per second, and while it was consistent, it was one of my complaints with that original release. A faster frame rate just makes for a better platforming experience. With Crash Bandicoot 4, however, the frame rate is now unleashed and unlocked. The game targets 60 frames per second, but delivering a beautiful Unreal Engine 4 game like this at a consistent 60 is no small task, and as we'll see, there are huge differences between each machine. So let's start with the smoothest version of all, the Xbox One X version. Here, the 60 frames per second target is reached at nearly all times, whether it's the real-time cutscenes or in-game antics, Crash 4 retains 60 FPS with relative ease. You might spot an occasional dropped frame here or there, and there are some levels where you'll notice even more, but it's rare enough that it's never really an issue. The game feels fast and responsive as a result. Whatever issues do remain will almost certainly be cleared up when played on an Xbox Series X and likely Xbox Series S as well. Either way, this is the best playing version of the game on current generation machines due to this very stable frame rate. Now, the PS4 Pro comes in second place. It's nearly as solid as Xbox One X, but I noted additional drops at various points throughout. Nothing too severe, mind you, it's really just dips into the 50s, especially during cutscenes, but it is there. The heavier levels definitely fail to hold 60, but it's close enough, so it's not a big deal overall. Both PS4 Pro and Xbox One X offer an excellent experience with the level of performance you'd want in a platform game like this. The PS4 Pro version definitely isn't as refined as Xbox One X, but they're both solid. The real problems come in if you're playing on the base machines, unfortunately. Basically, neither system can handle the game at 60 frames per second. On PS4, it basically runs with a completely unlocked frame rate. That means highly variable performance between 30 and 60 frames per second. It really hurts the experience for me. It's juddery and just wildly inconsistent. As an option, it would be fine, but I feel that a 30 FPS cap should exist for users playing on the base PS4. This would effectively solve the problem and deliver a game with the same level of performance as the Insane Trilogy. 
Xbox One S, however, is downright strange. Basically, it seems to teeter back and forth between two performance profiles. In some sections, the frame rate clamps down to 30 frames per second with correct frame pacing. The graph is completely level, as you can see. This happens right when you start the game, and I was happy to see it, as it's clear the original Xbox One couldn't run this game at a full 60 frames per second. Unfortunately, it doesn't last. At other points in the stages, the frame rate cap seems to disappear, delivering these unstable, uncapped performance results that feel terrible. It's even lower than the base PS4, really. There's just no reason for the frame rate to run without the 30 FPS cap in this case, so it's surprising to see it jump between the two. The behavior of the frame rate suggests that this isn't a double buffer V-Sync situation either. It's very strange. So yeah, that's kind of where we're at at the moment. The game plays great on the enhanced consoles, but the base experience leaves a lot to be desired. I feel the best solution here is an optional 30 frames per second cap, but I wouldn't get your hopes up. We should also touch on loading times briefly and the way loading is handled. It works mostly well, I'd say. Loading between stages is short enough, thankfully, but not as fast as the original games. It's comparable between all platforms, too. I'd imagine this is another area where the next generation backwards compatibility will help, however. More importantly, upon death, you do instantly respawn at the last checkpoint without loading. I wanted to make sure that I put this out there, as I think it's absolutely critical to a game like this. Thankfully, there's nothing to worry about. What's curious about the life and death situation in Crash 4 is that there are two options presented to you at the initial boot a classic mode and a modern mode. The difference really is the life system. In retro mode you have lives, run out of lives and you'll need to restart the stage. That's how the original games worked. In modern mode however you have infinite lives and always restart at the nearest checkpoint. It simply keeps track of the number of times you died per stage. Another nice quality of life feature is the enhanced shadows option, which, well, it's not really shadows. Basically, this places a small circular visualization below crash used for jumping. The idea is to help people judge the Z distance between platforms, as this has always been a complaint some folks leveled against the series. So in this case, you can choose to play it classic style without the aid of the circle, or take advantage of this extra feature to improve stage readability. I tried it both ways and found it to be a useful tool in certain areas, and it doesn't really detract too much from the challenge. So yeah, that's pretty much Crash 4 in a nutshell, at least on the visual side. The game itself delivers on the promise of a new Crash game, I think. It's a faithful continuation of the original three Crash titles, but with a few new mechanics here and there to spice things up. I'm a big fan of their overworld map as well, which is more in line with the original Crash rather than its sequels. There's a lot of unlockables as well, including bonus stages, costumes, and various other pieces of content hidden throughout the game. Not to mention some bonus characters. Really though, at this point, you already know if you like Crash Bandicoot. It's a solid, straightforward 3D platforming game. Now, it doesn't quite resonate with me the same way Tony Hawk 1 and 2 did, but it's good. My only real complaint stems from the soundtrack, which follows in the footsteps of the original games. I was never a fan of the Crash Bandicoot soundscape, and that continues to this day. Those droning drum beats just don't excite me, and I feel that I could have enjoyed the game even more with a more interesting soundtrack. Of course, your mileage may vary here, and I know that there are plenty of people that love those original soundtracks, and I think they'll be happy with what's in Crash 4. The one weird thing about the sound setup, though, is that, at least in my 7.1 setup, most of the sound effects seem to play from the rear channels while the music and dialogue come from the front. I guess it works well enough, but it is a little bit strange. That's Crash Bandicoot 4 then, a solid platform game that follows in the footsteps of the PlayStation Originals from Naughty Dog while offering a huge boost in presentation quality. It's a nice upgrade from the Insane trilogy as well. The smooth animation and beautiful environments really elevate the series to the next level, at least visually. The only real issue here, besides my distaste for the music, is the frame rate on base consoles. Running uncapped just doesn't work for these machines. It doesn't 
ruin playability per se, but it does create these visual distractions that hurt the experience, at least for me. Now, if you have an Xbox One X or PS4 Pro, you'll be just fine. Now, at this point, there's only one question remaining. Is Crash Bandicoot better than Bubsy? To answer this question, I've brought in the world heavyweight champion of Bubsy. Well, when you take into account the historical value, the diversity in gameplay, the longevity of the character, or the coating of fur on the bobcat allowing it to survive in rougher terrain and conditions than the Bandicoot, and the more 200 voice lines Bubsy artistically performs versus Crash Bandicoot's zero? Like it possibly, well, you're wrong! The answer is no. Crash Bandicoot is not a better character than Bubsy. Ring the bell, support the Bubster. But that's all from me for the moment. If you enjoyed this video, as always, be sure to let us know by liking, subscribing, ringing that notification bell, and following us over on Twitter. And until next time, this is John signing off. Featuring its new warp wireless technology, Omen's PC peripherals allow for lag-free gaming. From the 360-degree audio of its Omen frequency headphones, the 180-hour battery life of the Vector Mouse, and the 2.4 GHz connection of its Spacer keyboard, Omen has you covered for the ultimate wireless experience.